So we'll move on to our final question and hopefully have about five, 10 minutes to, to put in a couple of questions from our, from our attendees because we've had, we've had a lot. Um, and what I can do afterwards, questions that were sent specifically for certain people, I can make sure that our student organizers get them your way. Again, I want to respect our time. Um, so our, our final question will be asked by Hadil. Let me share it for a moment and I'll let Hadil ask. Go ahead, Hadil. Um, do you believe that reform is necessary as it pertains to the recent civil unrest? In your eyes, what does this look like? Thank you, Hadil. I know that this is a question that we can put a lot of time into. Yes. Um, we absolutely can. And, um, and I'm sure that I, have, I really have a feeling that our students are not going to be finished when it comes to the end of this town hall, that they're going to want to keep this conversation going. And I'm glad that they do. Um, but again, as we move forward, I want to stay focused on what we're doing and how we're strengthening each other right now. So thank you, Adil. What does that look like? Uh, if, 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 I, if I could quickly start on, on this one. Um, first of all, reform is absolutely necessary. And any elected official or politician that is not looking to advance reform for their constituencies of color, uh, specifically black men, women, black, uh, black trans community, needs to be kicked out of office immediately and needs to lose their job. Second off, I'm actually going to bring it to a national perspective and just talk about where we're at right now. After, and I don't say killing, after the murder of George Floyd, um, we had a Justice Act that was placed before Congress um, that, in my opinion, uh, didn't go far enough. It was focused too heavily on data collection and not enough on the legal change that would directly address misconduct uh, in police departments nationally. Now we have a the uh, George Floyd Justice and Policing Act that is being co-sponsored by Representative Bass uh, that is before Congress right now. Uh, HR 7120, if anyone's taking notes, HR 7120. This would require a national registry of misconduct by law enforcement officers. And I'm talking about immediate reform changes that we can see in, in, in the near future. Uh, it can require states uh, to report the use of force to the Justice Department. Um, it will require, and the key word is require here, it's not optional. It will require racial bias training at the federal level. Um, it will also have lynching as a federal uh, hate crime, which I'm sure that's a whole other conversation we can get into. And the final thing, which I think is one of the most important, it will demilitarize the police and limit the transfer of military equipment to our local law enforcement office, uh, uh, police departments. For everyone that's listening on this call, this is a piece of legislation that black and brown people in this country need. It's not a want, we need it to be passed. So whether you're white, whether you're Asian American, whether you're Native American, we need you to call your, especially federal elected officials, Senator Bob Casey, Senator Pat Toomey, uh, and tell both of them to advocate for this piece of legislation. I actually, and I'm almost done, Sergio, I know we're running out of time. Um, I actually want to give a shout out to my Republican counterpart, uh, Rep. Delosier, because she has really been a champion in the House of Representatives to have bipartisan uh, criminal justice reform and police reform uh, through our House of Representatives. But I, I just want to say to all other House members that the job is not done yet and we need more uh, reform and cultural reform passed through our House, through our State Senate, and Representative Delosier, if you could give uh, uh, bring back a me message to the Republican caucus for me, I hope that the same elected officials that are going out protesting Dr. Levine and Dr. Wolf over their handling of COVID will come out and protest with us for the um, eradication of police brutality and this, uh, the ceasing of killing of black and brown people and to unifyly say black lives matter in this country. Thank you, Mr. Goodman. Captain Crone? Here to bring it local again. Uh, Thank you. 
I think it's important that everybody watching, the, especially the people of our community, know what we're doing is the Lower Island Township Police Department. Um, we talk about bias training. We have that every year annually. Uh, whether it's required by federal law or not, we're going to keep it going. Um, things that are in the, all the reform bills, uh, we talk about banning chokeholds. We already do this. Uh, chokeholds are out of our repertoire, uh, unless it's uh, the most dire situation where uh, your choice is either to shoot somebody or put a chokehold on them uh, to save your own life. Uh, that, otherwise, they're gone. Uh, you're not, and it's been that way for a long time here in our community. Uh, De-escalation, before that was even a word, it was the practice here. Uh, we always train to talk when we can, we act when we must. Uh, we use the reasonable force necessary to achieve the lawful objectives. And then when it's over, you got to flip the switch. Uh, the situation stabilized, you, you provide the medical attention that's needed, uh, return people to recovery positions and move on from the situation and do the, the job that you got to do. Um, in 25 years here in Lower Allen Township, uh, we've never shot anyone uh, in my 25 years. And in the history of Lower Allen Township, I don't think this police department has ever shot anyone. Um, I, if, if we had an, a two-way with, uh, with the audience, I would poll them to see how many times do you think we've actually struck somebody with hands or feet in the last year or with a baton? The answer is zero. Uh, we've had four taserings in 2019. Each of those prevented us from having to use more uh, aggressive force. Uh, and the only injuries we've had to anybody in that time period are some scrapes and bruises and uh, some taser probe marks. So we're arresting people with dignity uh, whenever we can. Uh, 753 arrests in 2019. There were 22 use of force incidents in that entire time. Uh, it's a very small number of incidents uh, and in each of those everybody walked away from it. Um, sometimes in handcuffs, frequently in handcuffs, but uh, everybody gets to walk away and have their day in court uh, and that's that's the ideal situation. Um, in the last decade, I already talked about serious injuries, uh, Warnings before shooting, people are asking for that. Uh, that's, that's required, uh, unless you're actually, from a, practice, from a practical sense, if somebody's actually shooting at you, you don't need to absorb a couple bullets and then tell them you're gonna shoot back. But uh, you've got time and distance most of the time, you're, you're gonna talk about that. Um, you know, give the warnings, uh, prevent further escalation of force. Um, and we've had so many situations through the years where, um, we would have been justified had we used deadly force, uh, but the officers have been able to be patient, uh, able to talk to, uh, talk to the, the offenders and work it out in a different way um, to avoid that deadly force situation. Uh, that's not gonna be every circumstance. We train to be able to use deadly force if it becomes necessary, and the officers will do that if it becomes necessary. Um, but we've been, uh, I'm knocking on wood, and, and say in a prayer here, we've been able to avoid that uh, through my career and I hope it continues. Um, exhaust all alternatives before shooting, we talked about that a bit. Duty to intervene uh, is a big issue. Uh, to me, it's a moral issue as much as it is a policy issue. Um, and sometimes, as we know, it becomes necessary to legislate morality. Uh, if, if we didn't, uh, and if there were no thieves, we wouldn't have a rule against theft. Uh, but, uh, Agencies across the Commonwealth, uh, many have a rule that requires officers to report misconduct up the chain of command, but where sometimes uh, we fall short is that affirmative action when, when you see uh, an incident of brutality happening or something like that. Uh, that's, that's been kind of the unwritten expectation, but I think we're past that era now. Uh, both CALEA and PLEAC, the accrediting bodies, are instituting rules that require uh, this this duty to intervene. Uh, so do you have the, do you have it on the books, Captain? I'm sorry to interrupt, but do you have it on the books in Lower Island Township that one of your officers, if they see an incidence of police brutality, has to intervene, or is that just a encouraged? Uh, it is about to be on the books. Uh, it and it's one of those things that you think goes without saying, but in light of recent events, it can't go unsaid. Um, so so here we are at right. a crossroads, uh, and. I, I don't know if I said it already, but if you're, if you're not learning, you're not leading. Uh, and you need to do this to move forward. Uh, shooting at or from moving vehicles, um, that's, we've already banned that. Uh, and it's been, uh, in my entire career, we're not to do that. 
uh, it's just a bad practice in general. If you take the take out the driver of a multi thousand ton, pound vehicle, now you have this uncontrollable thing going down the street and taking out whatever uh, innocent victims in the vehicle that you could be dealing with. The only time that would be really acceptable is if the vehicle is about charging into a crowd of people and you have to weigh the choice of are these victims going to be uh, run over by this car or you know is this is this my last resort to save these people um so at or and from moving a terrible idea yeah and thank you captain crone um i i appreciate those two responses um we um there's we have a lot of questions that I, that i want to forward to each of you individually individually that was that were asked i want to be able to to finish on time and i'm sorry to the attendees that have questions but i can promise you that every question that you asked will be sent to our panelists, and I know for a fact that either myself or my students will follow up to ensure that we get responses. Um, I I want to thank all of you um, for being a part of this. Um, this couldn't have happened without these four students that you see in front of you. Um, their fierce approach. No, thank you, Captain Corona. They they do deserve a round of applause because they truly took it upon themselves to make this happen. Um, I it is not an easy thing to step on a platform and talk about these issues, especially when we have individuals, leaders from different sides of the gamma that are willing to have this conversation. Um, so I, again, my hat's off to everybody that's here right now. Um, in particular, I wanna thank some individual people who were incredibly helpful with all of this, the Cedar Cliff administration team, absolutely our panelists for taking the time to be here. Um, I wanna thank our students first and foremost, more than anybody else, this couldn't have happened without them. I, uh, I made the mistake of telling them that, I don't, I don't want to call it a mistake, but I made the mistake of telling them that there's a lot of things that I can try to do and they'll say no to me, but they can't say no to you. And man, did they run away with that. Um, so I'm, I'm like beyond proud of them. Um, I've, uh, some of the teachers at Cedar Cliff that have been, been incredibly supportive about this, uh, Mrs. Patricia Lackey, uh, Mrs. Caitlin Russell, Ken Jahoski, Mr. Whedon, Jock, this wouldn't have happened if you wouldn't have taken us to the first town hall in Elizabethtown. So I'm, I'm beyond grateful for what you did. Um, I, a colleague that I met recently from Milton Hershey School who helped me a lot on how to do this Zoom town hall meeting, Debbie Myers. Um, and uh, also uh, Josie Cook, who has been helping me a lot this summer when it comes to how to navigate all of these different things. Um, you usually end one of these things with an ask and the ask is simple here is to just that this isn't an, this meeting itself isn't enough. Uh, obviously, everybody here is making it a mission to act upon this. But for me and my role in my community and at Cedar Cliff High School, being a student support coach, um, I I'm just going to be really brute in saying that everybody here owes it to these students to follow up on all of this. And I'm unapologetically fierce and adamant about following up with each and one, every one of you to make sure that these questions are answered um, and that we continue moving forward. Um, Dr. Felgrove, any closing remarks before we move on? Heck no, wow. Uh, Mr. S how, about, how about a shout out to Mr. Santiago for, uh, for all the work that he's doing, huh? Yeah. Uh, what, a, what a good deal. Man, we, uh, we love you, uh, Mr. Santiago. We're, uh, we're just thrilled to death that you are part of the family here. And, and boy, panelists, I, I'm sitting back just totally freaked out that this was uh, so candid, so, uh, so uh, honest, so uh, vulnerable. That's a word that we keep using around, around the, the house here uh, at Cedar Cliff. And that I, 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 one of my biggest dreams is to allow a safe place where people can actually be honest mm -hmm. and tell them what's on their heart. I, I don't know how to, to tell you that I'm, I got goosebumps like all over the place that I just witnessed 90 minutes of, of folk being able to speak their minds and, and no one threw anything at me. Uh, so, I mean, it was just, just a, a, a absolute blessing. I am, I am absolutely, uh, students that are, that are listening uh, here, I'm absolutely blessed to be a part of your family here and a part of this uh, community. I mean, I, I, I I, I love it. I love this place. I love you all. I love the staff here. Um, and so, so thank you so much, uh, panelists, students, uh, for your time. Uh, I'm, I'm guessing this is just part one, mm -hmm. it is. Uh, to be honest with you. I'm guessing this is just That's part one. That's what I hope. And, and I'm, I'm, I'm thinking that, that there's not, I, I don't know a part whatever, but it's, it's going to, this can't just be one, one time. So we're committed. We hear you. We, we love you. We're going to do everything within our power to, uh, 
to make our community safer, to make our community a place that, uh, uh, I'll go back to what Molly said, where everybody gets to do what they're passionate about. I mean, I couldn't be uh, be happier about that. So thank you, thank you, thank you uh, thank to you all Dr. of you. So. Thank you, Dr. Philgrove. I'm gonna let Solomon, because um, he, he actually pressed the raise his hand button and he actually messaged me to say something before we finish off. So um, Solomon, um, send us away. I'd just like to say um, thank you so much, not just to um, all of the panelists or Mr. Santiago or Dr. Philgrove, but to everybody who um, chose to sign up <laughs> and attend the meeting. Because even though um, often when you look at political movements, you see um, people who are very vocal and who speak their minds, the truth is that um, we're always stronger when we act together, no mm. matter how persuasive we are individually. Better together. Thank you, Solomon. Again, thank you everybody so much. I appreciate your time, your sacrifice for being here, every single one of you. Thank you. Have a great day.